Charlemagne. There is a Charlemagne right there. He sent that to Constantinople to threaten them. Now, it's a battleship. They're starting to call these big ships in the line battleships. I mentioned those during the Battle of Trafalgar. And so it still had two tiers of guns, but it's hard to see it there a couple spots there. It also had a steam engine and a mast. So it used a steam engine and it would turn a turbine, or I'm sorry, just turn a wheel. But also they had mass to use air or to use wind too, but it still would. But it is near the end of the line because they're starting to make ships out of iron and then steel, which are going to be significantly stronger and longer lasting. But so they sent an old battleship to threaten the old empire, the Ottomans at Charlemagne. Omar Pasha, who is the head of state for the Ottoman Empire, gave in. There he is right there. I don't think he has enough medals. And the French occupied Palestine. Russia was furious, absolutely furious. And they attacked the Ottoman Empire. Now, remember, they want Constantinople. So the Ottoman, or so the Russians attacked here and attacked here, partially leading to independence of what is now Romania. They attacked like this. Well, Britain and France kind of panicked. They were worried if Russia got this, who knows where they would stop in the Mediterranean. Russia was incredibly imperialistic, and they want to protect their investments. At that time, Britain and France were talking about building a canal right here, which they would 20 years later. What canal? No? no. The Suez Canal. They're just talking about that. And the British would eventually kind of take it, and they would be obsessed about this up until 1957. Then Egypt would finally take it back. And so that would trigger the Crimean War. Russia would go against the Ottomans. Britain joined, France joined, and then Sardinia. Now, remember, they were one of the leaders of the Italian independence movement. They joined in, too. And so there's a lot of great propaganda posters. but. Here is the united British and French army, and there's the ragtag Russians. Now, Russia is huge, but Britain and France, they have, especially Britain, that really powerful navy. And so this war, and it would be the first major land war for both Britain and, and France, well, virtually anybody, since, the, since Napoleon, 1815. And this is an example of real politique. Real politique. So, Here's the new Queen of England, Queen Victoria, who was German. King William IV died without an heir. I didn't talk about that king. They had to find a Protestant. They went to a German household called the Saxe Coburgs and brought Victoria back. During World War I, they would change the name Saxe Coburg to Windsor after the castle because they're fighting Germany and they didn't want a German royal family name. So that's why today the royal family of England is called the House of Windsor, named after the castle. But the Germans. And remember what real politic is. Real politic, if we're not sure, make sure we get this down right here. It is to do whatever is in the best interest of your state. Do whatever's in the best interest. And that might that means you might ally with one country at one day and then turn on them the next day. Whatever it means to do what's in the best interest of the state. And so you're really going to see this with Germany, real politique. Palmerstam was the prime minister. He did it as he saw it as a power play against Russia. Count Cavour, who we'll come back to, was the prime minister of Sardinia. This is the King Victor Emmanuel II. Which, by the way, you got to admit, Victor Emmanuel, that will give Louis Napoleon's mustache a run for his money. Who thinks? Huh? I kind of like I like Napoleon slightly better, but they're both pretty good. Why would Sardinia join this? They want British and French support for a unified Italy. And that's what we got to get here. That's why you got to get Sardinia. Sardinia for Italy. And so with that, the Russians advanced to the Danube River right here. And in fact, look at the Russians might knock out the Ottomans. And so the British, the French, and the little tiny Sardinian contingents, they sailed into here and landed what is now Bulgaria 
to try to cut them off. And they started dropping like flies. What disease that is spread in fecal matter was spread throughout? Cholera. Cholera ravaged the forces. And they got the heck out of there and changed their plans and attacked the Crimean Peninsula. That's why it's called the Crimean War. And so they advanced here and attacked the Crimea. That's the Crimean War. Now, this is the first war in history that you have photographers. Now, the cameras are big, short, long exposure time, but you could see some of these very candid pictures. A number of photographers went with the British and the French. And so here we have French soldiers. Here are British soldiers, British soldiers, and the Crimean. So it's the first one you get these pictures. Not you can't really get a picture of the battle. It's, it doesn't. They can't get the cameras close enough, but at least some vision of it. And I like these French soldiers, Zouaz, playing poker. And here's a Russian map showing the battle. I know you were saying, what about a Russian map? Well, here it is. The Allied forces landed here, knowing that the main Russian army is here. Basically, they just want to make a victory and force the Russians a super peace. And so the main Russian port in all of the Black Sea was at Sebastopol. And so the plan was to land here and surround Sebastopol, cut them off before the Russians could get reinforcements. That's the plan. Blockade it, win the victory, force the Russians to super peace. And along the advance, right here, a massive battle will take place. That's going to be one of the most storied, most awful, horrific battles called the Battle of Belaclava. The Battle of Belaclava in 1854. And this battle was a Russian effort to counterattack before they're going to be surrounded. And this bloody fight would go on for days in 1854. And two really famous elements will come down in British and French history, but especially we'll get to the two British ones. First off, a thin line of red coats. That's why it's called the thin red line. Beat back massive Russians attacks. And where were these soldiers from? You see it? Yeah, these were Highlanders that were in kilts. And they beat off Russian attack after Russian attack. And here are Russians retreating in, in di disarray. Also, during the attack, the British commander, a lord named Raglan, panicked and ordered what was considered to be an elite, even though led by morons, brigade called the Light Brigade. And this became the infamous charge of the Light Brigade. Where they charged, here it's supposed to be a picture, there's a very stylized painting of it, where they charged Russian cavalry. And it was a suicidal charge by about 700 men. What is that weapon? Now we have two we gotta tell you. First off, we have about 12 smaller balls you fire. You remember grape shot? And there's another weapon called canister. Imagine a cylinder can about this wide, about that long, stuffed with very crudely made musket balls. So you can get about 200 of them in there. What is that going to be like if we fire that from a can? you imagine what that's going to do? They just mowed the cavalry down. 300 would be killed or wounded and about 500 horses would be massacred. So who's going to get hit? The horses. And Alfred Lord Tennyson, who had become the most famous poet in British history, soon become what's known as a poet laureate of Great Britain. He would write this and talk about into the valley of death rode the 600. And this would become one of the most famous poems of the war and a really weird movie about the, uh, uh, the Crimean War called The Charge of the Life Brigade. Remember the, the, the Waterloo, which I hope you guys like, has some kind of weird elements in it. This one has really weird elements and like cartoon bits come in. They got really kind of weird arts even in the early 1970s. So here's a couple more pictures off that battle, which would turn out to be a British victory despite the Life Brigade. More Zouaves, here's the encampment, British soldiers. Well, one photographer took two of the most famous pictures of the war. And these have become one of the most famous pictures of the battle. And this we refer to as the first wartime photograph. He saw this road near Bella Clava, and he took this picture, and it's covered with cannonballs. 
And so this became like they pr presented it as the after effects of the battle. I should add, they never took pictures of dead bodies. That was seen to be too often. The first picture photos of dead bodies that would be taken in war would be at the Battle of Antietam during the American Civil War. And then it became the rage to get dead bodies and photos. See these cannonballs? Well, he went and saw this road and took this picture. It's like the first wartime photograph. And you'll see this. People will show this. They, they post it now online. What actually happened was this. He got a bunch of men out, and he actually took a picture of it. They took a drug cannonball and placed them all over the road so he could get this photo. And so that's one of the first doctored photographs and fraudulent photographs of wartime history in the Crimean War. Well, eventually the Russians, we pushed back to Sevastopol, and the month-long siege of Sevastopol would begin. Both sides dug deep, deep, elaborate trenches. Here are British trenches behind the lines. A lot of those an artillery duel where they fired cannon, but there's still black powder, so it didn't do a lot of damage, but basically they starved them out. There'd be a few horrific battles. And this is an entire panorama where you sit in the middle and you kind of go in this big circle and go through the entire scope. Um, this, your seat rotates to the entire scope of the battle. And I didn't come across as good as I hope, but just imagine it looks like, just imagine it looks really cool. Finally, after a bloody fight, the Russians surrendered. The Russians would surrender. They couldn't get reinforcements. And that ended the Crimean War. This war would be famous for not only the brutality of the war and the, the, meaning, the meaninglessness of it, because you're really, what were they fighting for except for political gain by both sides? But also, Florence Nightingale would go along. Now, most of the nurses during war, in fact, most nurses were men. And the thought was that women could not handle this, which is actually kind of mind-boggling, considering what women had to handle, have you heard of childbirth. But they, they thought women could not do this. Well, she volunteered and went. And she nursed soldiers. And Risk called her and said, no idea how it was spread yet. And would keep stats up, counted the wounded, counted the dead, kept stats on who died of actual fighting, who was wounded in the fighting, who was sick by disease, who died of disease. They had never really done that before. And she came up with a startling fact. Three quarters of the British and French soldiers who died in the war, and the Russians would have been about the same, died of disease. And it just blew them away. It's no coincidence that this would help lead to using staffs to organize people. Remember, we saw that in the day the universe changed. After the war, she would start the International Red Cross. The International Red Cross. Why a Red Cross? Switzerland, their flag was a white cross. And Switzerland had proclaimed themselves to be neutral in war, and the idea would be the International Red Cross would be neutral. That's why. But they just reversed this because it wouldn't be Swiss. That's why. And so with that, the Treaty of Paris would end the war, 1856, and basically they demilitarized the Black Sea. No Russian or Ottoman fleet, the idea being that would not cause a war. The Russians, of course, would violate this in about 15 years. And everybody agreed to respect the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire is there. there. And here's the thing. Remember, that is a, the single man. It is at the end. And they still propped it up. They propped it up. And so with that, also living through this war was a turtle that was in the, in the um, London Zoo. And I found this looking for something else, and I had to put this up here. This turtle was born in 1839, so lived throughout this war and would finally die in 2004. This was king of it. Did you know turtles can live that long? Some turtles can live longer. One turtle they believe lived over 400 years. I remember when he was born. Came from the shell. I remember that day. So with that, let's get to one nationalist unification. We'll go from there. 
nationalist unification. This was a race. Many thought, well, who will unify first? The desire for German unification, this is German, or Italian unification. And even though it looked right there that German unification would be first, actually Italy had a slight jump on it. So let's do Italian unification. So these are the sum of the Italian unifiers and many, many years ago, I was a class in, in at the University of Montana, this is graduate school, I guess. But I just like the way he talked about the, the Italian unification. It's a fun teacher, Dr. Mayer. You remember Dr. Mayer, anybody? You don't remember him from 1991? Okay, so Count Cavour, he was Sardini, and he was the brains behind us. He called it the head, the mind. And then Garibaldi. The red shirts. And so even though they're obviously going to be more fighters, and this was a relatively small band, he represented those freedom fighters who would fight for him. And then Mazzini of young Italy. So he was the heart behind it. This rallying cry who had been fighting for Italian independence for 40, or Italian unification for 40 years. And then the king of Sardinia, King Victor Emmanuel. And so these are the main characters in this. And Cavour, the definition of real politics. Sardini had no reason to enter the war, but he did it because he basically was saying to the French, you owe me. You owe me now. Help me against the Austrians. I helped you, you help them. I say help them, help me. So in the middle was the Pope. Pope Pius IX, by the way, this is the first picture ever taken of a Pope. Pius IX, was sitting in the middle. He didn't want to give up his papal states. And the only way to keep it was the French staying there, which they've been there since 1849. But if he keeps the French there, that will infuriate Italians and make them more likely to try to kick the French out and take it. So he's kind of like the spoiler on this. Which side will he go on? So let's go and get what happened. First off, we have the Austrians controlling much of Northern Italy, the French in Paris. And Garibaldi fought the French in Paris, or I'm sorry, Paris, in Rome in 1849. Here is a very stylized picture of Garibaldi in the red shirts fighting the French and the brand new Italian flag. I have the royal Italian flag. And a few years ago, we had another Italian exchange student. That's great. He gave me that flag. He was from Sicily. I don't know, we have southern and northern Italy. That's very cool. So, Sardinia and Piedmont would be the leader of this. And Risorgimento. Close, right? All right. It's not good. Oh, I can't help it. It's English here. And that actually sounds a lot better. But English speak, I want to say good. It's like crazy. What word? Baloney. How do you spell baloney? How do you spell baloney? B O L H E. Yeah. Hey, baloney is fake meat, so it wants to have a fake word. I'm sorry, bologna's meat, pieces. Stuff that nobody liked. And brain, moving on. So first step, uh, last, we'll get, we'll get to a couple of these, we're not gonna quite finish it, but step one, those 1848 uh, revolutions. So during those revolutions, that set the stage, even though they're beaten, Sardinia Piedmont was in charge. They were the leaders of this, Garibaldi burst on the, onto the scene as this freedom fighter. And so it set the stage in 1848. They were defeated. I love the pictures with the Italian flag. You notice that the flag here, we have horizontal and then vertical stripes. They weren't sure yet. And then that's what the empire looked like here, the kingdom of two Sicilies. By the way, on the map I gave you, I put down two Sicilies. It's the kingdom of two Sicilies. And 
even though it says the papal states, they have very loose control. But throughout the various states up here, Austria controlled this. Oh, and it doesn't even say the title, because that's not going to become part of the first Italian kingdom. Number two, sending troops to the Crimea. That is going to get France on, on board. They participated in the siege. They brought like two ships and they made sure they had a seat at the table. A seat at the table when they did the negotiations. Next, after this happened, you notice the year. It's a, four, a few years afterwards at Plombier, which is in France, in um, southwestern France, southeastern France, I'm sorry, 1858, they met to intrigue against Austria. And they, France agreed to help Sardinia if they attack Austrian possessions in northern Italy. There's Carbor, there's Napoleon. How do we know it's Napoleon? The cool mustache and beard, right? The only, I think, advantage of having a, a long beard like that, wouldn't it be just about to do this? See? Hmm. Hmm. Try it. Hmm. How do you look there? You feel, yeah, you look smart. Okay. So, 1859, the next year, Austria, the, it's called the Austro Sardinian War. Aus, Sardinia attacked, and France jumped in on the side. Now, if you know two countries in a war, Almost always, the first country you name, lost. You know got that? So who lost? And where we all lost? So Austria lost. And so that's why we're soon at the Franco-Prussian War, the Austro-Prussian War, the Dano-Prussian War, the Russo-Turkish War, the Spanish-American War. Who won the Spanish-American War? The United States. And... Uh, Talon is wearing a uh, Montana State shirt, and, but the proper term for that be historically would be the cap risket. And so the way, that's what I said. So, sorry, but you're gonna do it. And so with that, and so number five, Garibaldi made a big deal about unifying with Sardinia Piedmont. And as this war is raging here, he took his red shirts, just a few hundred of them, landed in Sicily, and then marched up, up into Naples, and the Kingdom of Two Sicilies collapsed, and Garibaldi unified them with Parvor and, and Piedmont. So now they have all this area right here. So we almost have Italy. Then, the Austro-Prussian War. 1866, Austria and Prussia went to war. Italy, or sorry, now it's becoming Italy, they jump in. Italy takes advantage of that to take Venetia. Everyone got that? And now we almost have this. And then it's going to be annexed in Italy. We almost have full Italy right here. So we have the Austro-Sardinian War, now the uh, Austro-Prussian War, and now we need one more, because more. You notice here, what country still have troops in Rome? France. Last step. French troops leave in 1870 because of the Franco-Prussian War. They're needed desperately back in France. That allows not only Garibaldi, but Sardinian forces to enter Rome. Rome fell without even the firing of shot. And now Rome will become the capital. I should have to be a gray area about the, the papal states for years. Eventually, Rome would allow the papal states to become an independent country within Rome called the Vatican. It's about one square mile. It's an independent country inside Rome. And so Rome is unified. I'm sorry. Italy is unified. Now, there was no shooting, but at one of the old gates going into, into, uh, into Rome, they decided to act like there was a fight. So they shot a bunch of holes in it. They shot a couple cannons in it. So they get this picture of a fake attack on Rome to make it seem like the glorious victory 
and they defeated the forces. No, they just walked in and took it. And now it's unified. And I love the, the right leg in the boot at last. But they're not done yet. Okay, Italia Irredenta. Just say Irredenta. Italian Irredenta. They're not quite done. Why? Let's go back to this map. If you want to have this and one more region, does anybody know the area that Italy claimed? This whole coast that was part of it. So Italy's unified, but not 100%. And out of this, what comes from this? Oops, we're going the wrong way. The kingdom of Italy. To the flag. And, of course, out of that flag will come the first pizza. They had this before, but the first, what we really considered a pizza, and this would influence it when American soldiers went through World War II, they brought it back. Italian immigrants, too, but didn't hit till American soldiers in World War II. But remember the colors of the flag. Red, white, green. Red tomato sauce. Mozzarella cheese. Basil. That is the Italian flag, the Italian pizza. And yes, that is a pizza from a place in Naples claiming to be the first pizza. And it was, and I want to be very, very clear about this. Not as good as Don. No, it was so much better. It was so good. Nothing against Domino's. One thing, though, being uh, someone from the United States, we're used to getting a pizza and they cut it up into slices. We're just used to that. And so we got the pizza there and a knife and a fork. And it was just different. I was like, oh, wow, that's cool. So one of these days for Italian independence, I'm looking at maybe the week before vigilante parade, we might have pizza for Italian. Sound good? I was going to buy it, but but MS informed me she's going to make some from. Is that what you said? Uh oh. And I would be glad to take orders for pizza as long as it has only three only three toppings: tomato, basil, and mozzarella cheese. Yes. Didn't you say that there are like two restaurants in Naples? Yeah. Who aren't doing that they made for two, two claim. And so we flipped a coin with one. <laughs> that was when I saw somebody walk and not walk in Naples when we saw somebody hit by a car. And everybody got out of the car and started screaming. And, and people on the street started screaming at the person who got hit. <laughs> and that's when I realized, wow, Naples is something else. And am I right? Is that? That's exactly, it was, and so we avoided the streets. All right, so you have a little, oh, I didn't give you much time. So we'll do our data more, and I'll give you a little bit of time more on the map. I'll tell you what I'm doing the map. I'm revising the map assignment. I'm allowed to change my mind. Are you happy with that? The whole thing will be due on Monday. Now, bring your listeners to go around and check the Italian stuff. The whole thing will do Monday. Got it? Everyone cool with that? Everyone has a review list for the test. Romantic art, German unification, and then test. We got to fight another war, everybody. And what are, what are the little ones? The little uh, nerve. Nerve. And then the curry verse. That was the one that we went with on the curry. Do you like them? Snow seems to be lightning a little bit. Weather app time.
He wants to be down here when he says. Ouch. You guys over here. 26 degrees tonight. Soon as you can take that back, we gotta get done. Soon as you can do it. Soon as you can do it. Why are we okay? That's fine. I just, I don't want to forget. 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 I don't want to I 